Good morning. Welcome to this to this service of worship from the First Congregational Church of Westminster United Church of Christ. We are happy that you are worshiping with us this morning. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. This service is being videotaped and will be shown online later today. There will not be an offering taken during the service. However, there is an offering plate near the exit up front where you may leave your offerings as you depart. Offerings may also be mailed to or dropped off at the church office or submitted electronically. As a Christian community, we are called to love one another and to be especially sensitive to the most vulnerable among us, wearing masks throughout the service and social distancing from our fellow worshipers who are not of your own household are required, unless you have a, a valid medical reason not to wear one. Today we will be celebrating the Sacrament of Holy Communion using sealed containers of gluten-free wafers and non-alcoholic grape juice. Your empty containers and bulletins may be deposited in the recycling receptacle near the exit as you leave the sanctuary. Uh, announcements? Good morning. I'd like to call your attention to our uh, communion hymn. It's called Come to the Table of Grace. And speaking of grace, we're going to sing it without having music encumbering our eyesight. <laughs> so I'm going to line out. We're going to do two verses. And you're going to repeat after me. It's called Come to the Table of Grace. Come to the table of grace. Come to the table of grace. Oh, come on, you can do that. Come to the table of grace. Come to the table of grace. Come to the table of peace, of grace. Come to the table of grace. This is God's table. This is God's table. It's not yours or mine. It's not yours or mine. Come to the table of grace. Come to the table of love. Come to the table of love. Come to the table of love. This is God's table. This is God's table. It's not yours or mine. It's not yours or mine. Come to the table of love. I will be playing the melody for the prelude offering, and then when it's time, we'll come together and sing from our divine memory. Thank you. And now, let us prepare our minds and hearts for the, for the worship of God. Thank <laughs> you. 
please join me in the responsive call to worship? We have come to worship God, a living God. Who calls prophets and teachers to bear witness. We have come to praise God, the Almighty God. Who answers the forces of hatred and on earth with the power of grace. We have come to worship God, all gracious God. Who chooses to be the new and to receive into every word of life and hope.
letter. It can be found on page 1048 in your key line. Now, I should remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn receive, in which also you stand, though which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I hand it on to you as of first importance that I in turn have received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to someone untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we were proclaim, and so you have come to believe. so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also, were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. He brings this reading of God's word, and may God bless our hearing and our living God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The Apostle Paul, also known as Saint Paul, 
is credited with having written more of the New Testament books of the Bible than anyone else. His writings give us some of the most enlightened interpretation of the meaning of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. His teachings do more than anyone else to help us to understand how the church should function if it is to reflect the love and justice of Jesus in the world. In the passage we read this morning from Paul's first epistle to the Christians in the Greek city of Corinth, he gives a concise reminder of the salvation that is possible through what Jesus has done for us. He writes, I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I have proclaimed you, which you in turn received, in which you will now stand, through which also you are being saved. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn have received. For I hint that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Paul was personally responsible for spreading that good news, for converting others to a faith in Jesus, and for starting new churches wherever he went. He did those things often at great risk to himself, and ultimately, at the cost of his own life. But despite all the great contributions that Paul made for the benefit of his own and future generations of Christians, it is something else that Paul says in this passage that really gives me pause. It's where Paul writes, I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle. Now, an apostle is, by definition, someone who delivers a message. Nobody ever did more to spread the message of what it means to be a Christian than Paul. Yet, he calls himself least among all the apostles, and unfit to bear that label. Do you remember in childhood, maybe on a playground, when somebody put you down? You might have come back with something like, I know you are, but what am I? But when Paul is, insists that he is unfit to be called an apostle, I want to come back with something like, if you are unfit to be called an apostle, then what am I? If Paul claims to be the least of all the apostles, then what chance do I or any of us have of faithfully and productively serving Christ with our lives? A clue to the answer to those questions can be found in the last part of that verse, where it says, For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Saint Paul, you see, had not always been such a saint. His very first reaction to the message being spread about Jesus by Jesus' disciples was not to embrace it, but to do everything he could to stamp it out. He violently persecuted those early apostles as dangerous heretics because he believed in his heart that that was what God would have him do. It wasn't until Paul was on a mission to arrest Christians that he was suddenly blinded by a light and heard the voice of Jesus calling him that he became the Paul that we know. But Paul never let himself forget who he had been and what he was capable of before that transformation. And because he put it down in writing to a letter to the Corinthians, a letter which we still read today, he wasn't going to let anybody else forget it either. Neither did he let, let go unsaid what it was that changed the staunch enemy of the church that he had been into the champion for Christ that he had become. In the next verse of that epistle he wrote, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. It was the action of God's grace, God's unconditional love, and God's transformative power to redeem lives, displayed beyond a shadow of a doubt in the complete turnaround of Paul's own life, 
that lent an undeniable authenticity and an indisputable credibility to the words that Paul's lips and pen proclaimed. There's an expression that Paul uses twice in this passage, in vain. In vain literally means not succeeding in attaining an intended outcome. The first place that he applies this expression is in a warning against believing in vain. His concern for the Corinthian Christians was that their believing that Jesus died and was resurrected for their sins was not producing the outcome of a visible spiritual vitality among them. The other place where he uses the term in vain is in reference to himself. After reminding them of being, his being unsuited to be an apostle because he had once actively persecuted Christians, he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And God's grace to me has not been in vain. Paul holds himself up as a model to the Corinthians of how amazing God's grace can really be. That grace can transform the most resistant of people into God's agents for change in the world. A Galilean fisherman named Simon at first doubted and then only reluctantly accepted Jesus' invitation to let down his nets for a great catch of fish. When he saw the result, he was positive that he was too sinful of a man to do greater things that Jesus would call him to do. Well, today we know that sinful man by the name of St. Peter. John Newton was a slave trader, trafficking in human lives. Then God's grace took hold of his heart and steered his life in a new direction. He became an Anglican minister and an abolitionist. He wanted his personal encounter with God's grace to be an example to others who were living their lives in vain with respect to God's purpose for them, as he had once done. The result was the hymn, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. When it comes to God's will for us, most of us fall somewhere in between slave traders and saints on the spectrum of living by faith or living in vain. But the issue is not whether God is calling you to some form of ministry. The only question is what kind of ministry God has planned for you. And whether you will answer that call. You may think that you have nothing to offer God. And that you are less qualified or less spiritual than a million other people that God could call upon. If you do feel that way you may be missing an invitation that God is placing in front of you. And you may be depriving the world of something that no one but you can provide. So may you recognize the moments when God comes calling on you to some form of service. A service for which you are certain you are the wrong choice, but for which God knows that.
together and find a sign of prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, when you walked on dusky roads or sat by glistening waters, you met people where they were. You bent down low to heal the leper or to restore sight to the blind. And so our prayer today is that our world will know your healing touch and your forgiving heart. That those who have been hurt by insincere actions and damaging words will hear your healing voice. That those whose lives are filled with dark thoughts or unimaginable fears will know your peace. Walk beside those who are close to giving up hope and where life seems to have no point. Where people struggle to make ends meet. May they experience the touch of a caring hand and an end to injustice and fear. And may all who weep and mourn or feel abandoned and unloved turn toward your voice and hear the whisper of your presence in the long hours of night. Inspire us and encourage us to bend down low to embrace those for whom society has no time or patience. Raise our eyes to see the struggling, patient, and the exhausted caregiver. And where young and old stumble and fall, may we be there to offer support that all will know your love that transcends all others. We pray now in silence for those on our prayer list and those who we raise to you in the stillness of our hearts. 